people know me as the guy that wrote the book on Google ads and 8020 and Facebook. Um, and so if you do pay-per-click advertising, then you, you might know who I am. Um, and uh, I, I grew up a pastor's kid in a super conservative um, environment. And, um, you know, a lot of people, there's this thing that you hear all the time. Well, you know, you get, re you get religion from your parents. Um, and and it's, uh, it's sort of what it's usually said with some kind of an implication like, yeah, well, you know, people just accept things unquestioningly and, uh, and it, it's almost like, a, you know, kind of a crap rolls downhill sort of a statement. And, uh, you know, I don't know about anybody else, but in my case, like I, I really had to put it on the anvil and swing and see if it would hold up. Cause I, I can't believe stuff just cause if you read my books, if you look at my work, like, I question everything. And so faith was no different. And I, I went through multiple phases of, hey, man, does this really make sense? Well, um, in 2003, I went to my friend's house and we had this little, it was right after the first of the year, uh, kind of like this time of year. Um, it was probably like January 2 or something. And, um, and he asked us to like, well, what, so what are you going to do this year? And I wrote down mail order evangelism. <laughs> now, what did that mean? Um, I have to unpack that. What it meant was, okay, Perry, you've been doing marketing for about five years and you're reasonably good at it now. And so you should figure out a way to share your faith using your marketing chops. And so that's what I wrote down. It made sense to me. And but I didn't 2003? know. 2003? Yeah. Yeah. It's wow. 2003. Okay. Wow. Okay. Um, and well, so about two or three months later, um, I... I ended up like hatching this idea. And what I did was I wrote an email series called seven great lies of organized religion, which still exists. You can search for it and sign up for it and read them all. They're, they're still, they're good. <laughs> and, um, and I, and I, I set up an email box so that any replies would go back to me. And so that I could have a conversation with people and then, and this is the early days of Google ads, okay, like really early. Google ads had probably existed for a year, and most people still didn't know what it was. And I started buying clicks for like five cents a click and bidding on words like religion and stuff, and eventually using the display network. And pretty soon I had, um, well, to make a long story short, I built a couple of these websites. I ended up building an email list of 275,000 people. Now, um, I had a deeper motive in doing this, though. Um, yes, I wanted to share my faith, but I had a question. And the question was, can Christianity stand up to skepticism, scrutiny, criticism, and questions? Or will it fall apart? And I thought, I've invented a really good way to find out. Mm. Because these ads are showing every all over the world, and I'm getting every kind of person you could possibly imagine. And some of these people are coming out swinging. And some of these people have read a lot more books than I have. And I kind of want to see if this thing's going to hold up. And that was almost like the real reason I did it. Wow. It was even more than, it was like, and it was also, you know, if some stuff crumbles and stuff, some stuff is left standing, 
what's going to crumble and what's going to be standing up. And for about a year, I was kind of not real sure how this was going to turn out <laughs> because, man, some of these people were incredibly smart and incredibly articulate. And, and you know, like if you understand the 80-20 rule, you understand like the top 0.1% of the people that you get might be extraordinarily smart college professors and authors and experts and, and everything. And so, so that, that was like, well, that was the anvil. And this ended up, this ended up driving me all kinds of interesting directions. Um, it eventually, to make a really long story short, it resulted in a book called Evolution 2.0 and a technology prize called the Evolution 2.0 prize, which is a $10 million um, technology prize for figuring out where did life come from with judges from Harvard, Oxford, and MIT. It is the largest fundamental science research prize in the world now. Wow. Um, and, and, and so basically what did I find as a result of doing all this? Well, it was like an 80, 20 of the Christian faith. It was, it was major on majors and what can you defend? And you know what? You can, if, if you want to say that Jesus died and rose from the dead 2,000 years ago, there is a pretty good case that that happened. And there is no convincing alternative explanation that would explain the facts. And we're not going to like go into some deep thing here today, okay? But like the historicity of the New Testament, the accuracy of like, books like Luke and Acts and all these little historical details that they mentioned that most people don't even notice. You can go verify that all these things are true. Like, you know, Christianity is a factually defensible thing. Now, some things I couldn't defend, like, for example, I found it's pretty much impossible to defend an assertion that the earth is 6,000 years old. If you try to do that in public, you will get smashed. <laughs> um, the earth is not 6,000 years old. And so like, there's, there were also a lot of interpretations and like little shibboleths and sacred cows that you find that Christians hang on to that, that I couldn't defend at all. And it was actually like, um, well, you know, it's like you take a, this big thing and drop it in an acid bath and then pull it back out. Like, well, you know, the really good stuff still holds together. And so and so that's kind of how my journey's been. And so, so you were, you were kind of asking me, okay, well, you, you know, you talk about this stuff and in your business and stuff. Well, in my business, you know, I, I have all of these entrepreneurs from hundreds of different industries and, and I, and all these clients and I, I love my customers and I have a great time like doing what I do. And, you know, my job is to share with people what works and, you know, the reason we do sozo inner healing and uh, what I call memos from the head office, which are prophetic words and things like that, is because this stuff works. In fact, um, some of that stuff is like the best diamond tip saw blade for solving certain kinds of problems that I've ever found. So, for example, I'd say about 12 years ago, 13 years ago, uh, I hit this spot in my life where, um, you know, most people just kind of call it the midlife crisis, but like everything was falling apart at the seams, okay? Uh, marriage problems, um, all this personal garbage was coming up. Um, there, I think most people, if they're honest with themselves and like they're, you know, not avoiding the realities of life, eventually you get to a point where you figure out, hey, man, like, I got a lot of baggage. <laughs> <laughs> okay, like, you know, I can, uh, I can uh, lay on a couch and talk to the therapist about my mom or my dad or this or that, and, and like, man, the, like, this stuff is really affecting me. Um, and so, so I get plunged into this, and, and I start, like I'm up to my eyeballs and problems that I don't know how to solve. And then I, um, you know, that's also a point in my life where I started, I started getting real 
with my friends and my friends started getting real with me and I started figuring out that everybody had these problems and it wasn't just me. And I also got really depressed because as far as I could tell, most of them weren't solving their problems and most of them didn't know how. And most people were just sort of coping with stuff and like medicating with some addiction or some bad habits or something and like not really solving anything. And some people were just going to 12 step meetings for the rest of their life. And man, like I was getting really depressed. And then I, okay, so I'm a marketer and I like, I have access to all of these interesting people mm. and my world consists of like the alternative version of like everything. Right. Right. Okay, so how, how many personal coaches do I know? And how many therapists do I know? And how many hypno, hypno, hypnosis people do I? And like, and it go, like the list goes on and on and on. I mean, there's just all these things that I started. I'm like, okay, I'll talk to you about that. Like, uh, you know, and, and I start going through and I find out, you know, most of this stuff doesn't really work. At least not for the hard stuff. It might solve the easy problems. It doesn't solve, solve the hard problems. Well, one time I was having this conversation, in fact, two different people. So one was a woman who had been molested by her brother when she was eight, wow. and it had created some crippling emotional problems for her and some very serious problems in her marriage, in her sex life and everything. And then I had another friend who was molested by his dad for years, and he had a bunch of similar, he had like the male version of like all the same problems. And both of these people, um, they, they used the Sozo uh, approach and they both got significant removal of most of their issues. She's like, oh yeah, you know, me and my husband, we're, we're, we're in good shape. Like we've got past this stuff and same thing with him. And I was like, okay. If this stuff can solve rape and incest, we could probably solve some financial head trash. Because if anybody that does what I do figures out, it's not as much about your business education as much as it is about how emotionally clear you are and how much head trash you have and how conflicted you are about being successful and money and all this kind of stuff. And so we we did this thing called a financial Sozo seminar and it was a really, it was really successful. And the way we did it was I told everybody, this will work on anybody. You don't have to be a Christian and this is not going to be a come to Jesus meeting. I pretty much tell people that a lot. Like <laughs> I'm a Christian. Everybody knows, everybody knows Perry's a Christian. All right. Not hiding it, not ashamed of it. Cats you know what? <laughs> you can you could be a Buddhist, you could be a Hindu, agnostic, Mormon, Jehovah's Witness, Jewish, New Age, whatever. I don't know if it'll work if you're like a hardcore atheist, probably not gonna help you. But you know, if if you're at least open, um, you know, when I read my Bible, like God talks to all kinds of people. He doesn't just talk to Jews and he doesn't just talk to Christians, like go read it if you don't <laughs> believe me, okay. And, um, and, and I go, you know, this might be a Jesus comes to you meeting, but this is not a come to Jesus meeting. Okay. <laughs> so we're not going to like, we're not going to push any of this on you. I love and that. like, and it, it, it was, it was really successful. In fact, if you go to my YouTube channel, which is called planet Perry, you'll find a Sozo session of a guy. Like, I can't believe we found a guy that would do a Sozo session on video and put it on YouTube, but we found one and he did it. Um, and you can watch the whole thing. You can see how it works. And like he, it was this enormously um, liberating thing for him. And then he shot a video six months later telling us how different his life was after he, he had done this. And so, and so planet Perry for those you know, we do this in a permission marketing kind of way. So like we have a spirituality email list and people can opt into it and they can opt out of it. And they're not going to get very much of this stuff if they don't want it. But occasionally we'll put out an invitation. Um, and it's like a Planet Perry is a demilitarized zone. It's like the strip of land between North and South Korea. And it's like, 
I'm not like proselytizing you and I'm, I'm not, you know, criticizing your religious practices or anything. I just want to give you a chance to use the tools, the resources, the approaches, um, and kind of tap into the spiritual space. Like, you know, if you don't have a connection with God, try borrowing mine for a day and see how that works. And so, well, you know, people, people really like it. Um, and it, it keeps growing and nobody seems to complain about it either. Like it, I'm kind of astounded. Um, I mean, I got, I got people like raking me over the coals about my views about evolution and stuff, but, but I don't have anybody raking me over the coals because I do, uh, memos from the head office meetings for, you know, or, or, or Sozo sessions and stuff. So it's, I don't know. It's pretty interesting. I mean, who could have imagined it? That's for sure. Well, I, I'm on your email list, Perry, and I, I would say that if some and 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 we all have different. God is God is uh, really bringing a lot of us together, and we have different calls, you know. And I would say this: if somebody feels, um, and I, I advocate for this a lot, Perry, because now, so obviously, hundred X is a very overtly Christian kingdom brand, right? Which over, we're on fire. Like I'm, I feel called to gather the believers, equip and empower, like, you know, it's, it's, it's a sending movement. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a gathering and equipping and sending movement, but that's not how I broke into marketing. That's not how I, you know, like this was, this is very new for me. It's only 18 months old. Before that I had a, I had a, I was just a financial planner who had re, you know, rebuilt my business on kingdom principles and, and obeyed the Lord and wrote, some, wrote a book, did some ads. And, and so there are people who may be called to have a more overtly Christian brand, as do I. However, guys, I, just, I, I'm, I'm wanting to just be like, I don't think that's, just like I don't think ministry, just like I don't think vocational ministry and being a pulpit minister is, is for most people, I think that's I think that's for a small number of people, because the fact is only a certain number of people are actually going to show up in church. I actually think the majority of us are probably called to some type of covert, be great at what you do, solve mm -hmm. problems, serve people, be the best at X. Perry is one of the best people in this game of marketing. He was he's been there at every turn when it was Google. He was there with Google. Then it was Facebook. He was there at Facebook. Like, so here Perry has built this um, reputation as somebody who is great at what he does, has skill sets, has solved problems, and, he's, and people have been benefited by his guidance. So now when he puts an invitation and says, hey, do you really want to know the secret sauce behind much of what works for me? They're, they're, already, they're like, yeah, Perry, we're already doing what you're telling us to do. And I've seen you navigate this. The reason why I don't think you have so much opposition, Perry, is I, I think you are one of the best people I've ever seen at, at representing Jesus, at offering the kingdom in a very in a way that isn't pushy, is not offensive, it is permission based, and and it's done with so much tact. I see so much tact and wisdom and grace and really love. It's really it's because you love the people that you serve. And you love them enough to give them the dignity to make their own decision. And I think that's why you don't have any more anywhere near the pushback and warfare that you might have expect we, because you have so much grace and wisdom. And so, guys, I think what Perry has been doing is a model, can be a model, should be a model. As an example, for those of you that feel called to have a covert business to serve believers and unbelievers alike and still find a way to share Share what's working. Share the kingdom in a way that doesn't ever feel. Perry, I get your emails, and yes, of course, I'm a Christian, I'm a believer, but they never feel pushy to me. I don't see agenda. I just see love and transparency. And so, um, I, I I just wanted to share those thoughts because that that's what I see, and I love getting those emails. And I do think you're, I do think you are a forerunner and a pioneer, and 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 someone who's been doing this for a while now. Um, talk about the memos from the home office. You, I mean, you do events. Guys, Perry does events, live events that are really organized around the prophetic. P 
people like people fly in, buy a plane ticket, come to Chicago. It's cold as hell in Chicago. They come. <laughs> like, they come to Isn't that funny. <laughs> they come to it doesn't have to be in, you know, some warm they fly to this cold place to and pay money to like get prophetic words. And there's people in church <laughs> that won't even show up on Sunday for free. And Perry's got <laughs> You know, so Perry, talk about that because I love it. And it's, and it's just where the idea come from and share some testimonies of what's happening at these events. Do we have a hard stop on the time here? I don't. Do you? No, I'm good. Okay. So, well, first, so let, let me give you a, a wider story around this. Okay. okay. Um, and then I'll tell you more of what we do. So one of the most important events that I ever, ever happened to me in my whole life was it was, it was in 2003, I was, um, I had just read Richard Koch's book, The 80-20 Principle, which is one of the best business books ever written, period. And, um, and I, I, I got to page 14, and I'm like, hey, wait a minute. He, he makes this throwaway comment about how this, this all has something to do with chaos theory, and I was like, ooh, wait a minute, what, is, wait a, uh, that means I started connecting all these dots and I go, hey, 80-20 must be a calculus formula. What's the calculus formula? I started looking around. I couldn't find it. And I was like, how would you figure this out? And I was stuck. So I, I was obsessing about this. It was a Friday. And all day long, I, I, I have a very obsessive personality. And I was thinking about this all day long. And the, the other thing I was thinking about that day was three days before, I had done a teleseminar. Remember when it was like a telephone thing and not a webinar thing. <laughs> and I, I had sold $11,000 of stuff in one hour, which at the time was just a miraculous amount of money. And I was like, hey, I wonder if I could use my business to help this little project in Mozambique, which was the 18th poorest country in the world, because my brother-in-law was running this project there. So all day long, I'm thinking about calculus and Mozambique. And there was this music thing at church, and I went to it. And so they're playing, it's like this Pink floyd -y kind of music, and I'm just in la-la land, and I'm just thinking about calculus and Mozambique. And all of a sudden, I look up, and this woman is walking straight towards me. She's black. I've never seen her in my life. I don't know who she is. She sticks out her hand. She says, hi. My name is Vivian, and the Lord gave me a word for you. Now, up to this point, I have never had anything like this happen to me. Um, where I grew up, they didn't have anything like that. It's like, don't bring any of that stuff around here. She goes, the Lord told me that you're very, very good at math, and you're working some kind of formula, some kind of equation, some kind of invention, and you're going to figure it out. You just keep working on it. You're going to figure it out. And I just stared at her like, holy cow. And I looked around like, how many people in this room are working on a math problem right now? Dang. And she turned to walk away. And then she spun around again. She goes, oh, and he told me something else. You want to support missions, and God is going to bless your business so you can support missions. And, okay, two in a row, baby. She <laughs> nailed me. And I just stared at her with my mouth open. And I go, if only you knew. And she goes, he knows. And she just walked away. And I stood there. I was like, did that just happen? Oh, my word. Now, listen. Everybody really listen to me here. I know Uncle Carl had cancer, and you prayed for him, and he died. Yeah, I know. And somebody's baby had meningitis, and you prayed for him, and he died. Okay? And, like, I know you were sitting there one day, and you go, okay, if God, if you're real, show me a sign. And, like, there was no like words painted across the sky and you're like, well, okay. So I don't know if God is real. You know what? It only takes one, like tap on the shoulder and then, you know, yeah. 
Okay. And it's like ignorance, may be bliss, but you can't unlearn a truth. Hmm. Okay. And like, you know, God does not respond to every whim and every, you know, every person that like puts, you know, lays down the gauntlet or whatever. Okay. But, you know, it only takes a couple of those experiences that are so ridiculously improbable, you know, like Vivian nailing those two things. Like, what are the chances of her getting both of those things right, walking up to a random stranger in a place she'd never been in this, she'd never been there before. I was kind of new myself. Okay. And so it was like, from that point forward, I knew. Okay, Perry. Well, so the story isn't over. So the math formula, I finally figured it out three years later. Wow. It's the backbone of my 80-20 book. There's a website where you can punch numbers into it. The, the calculus formula itself got published in Harvard Business Review in 2018. <laughs> okay. And so, that, so, that's, so that's the math formula. She, go, she also said, God is going to bless your business so you can support missions. Well, later that year, my business hit the hockey stick. The reason it hit the hockey stick was because I started teaching Google ads. And back then, Google was just this weird little company. Like, they were not the 800-pound gorilla of the internet, but they are now. And, like, before that all happened, I wrote a book about Google AdWords, and then it went supernova, and I just, like, rode, rode the thing. And, and then a couple of years later, I looked back at these old emails, and I figured out that three days before I met Vivian, I got invited to speak at a Google AdWords seminar or an internet marketing seminar, like, we need somebody on Google AdWords. And I told him a name of a guy, and the guy turned him down, and he came back. He said, I think you should do it. <laughs> okay? So, like, I've got this story. And so I've told this story hundreds of times to my customers, and I've told a lot of other similar stories because I've had these things happen to me over and over and over and over and over. I mean, I could tell stories for hours like this, Okay, and they're real. And uh, in some cases, I have documentation that the stuff actually happened. And I can go back into a notebook it's like, well, I got this. And then look what happened. So I've got a, a ton of this stuff. And so we started doing these experiments. And what we did was, the first experiment was, well, 10 years later, when I published 80, 20 sales and marketing, I went and hunted Vivian down until I found her. And, and, and I said, hey, um, I'd like to try an experiment. I want to do a webinar. I want to get you and this other similarly gifted lady. And what we're going to do, we're going to get 30 people on a webinar. I'm going to read you their first name, and you're going to, like, give them a word. Go. And let's see how that works. It was just a crazy experiment. So we did. And so I got Aaron and Vivian, and I go, John F., go. And then they would go. And then, then they would get done. And then I go, Gary C., go. And then they would do Gary C. And they, you know, then they would do Susan M., you know, and, it, and we just go on. And people, people sit there and they type in the chat box. They're like, this is unreal. Like, how do they know this stuff? It's like they're reading me my diary. And, and so, that became a part and parcel of our Renaissance Club. So if you're a member of Renaissance Club, which is a marketing membership with, you know, with newsletters and membership bonuses, like and discounts and all this other stuff, well, you also get, you get to be on a memo from the head office call every month. So now we have them like every week because we have so many people that want to be on them uh -huh. that we have to kind of ration it out. And, so we also do live events called Memos from the Head Office. So like um, uh, we had one about a month ago in December in Chicago. It's like, hey, come to Chicago. We'll have a one-day thing. And so like I got these four prophetic people. Go, right? And so we did all this stuff and, you know, and then pe people, people get the all this encouragement and, you know, course corrections and everything like that. And then uh, a lot of the customers, they, they, 
they hired the memos people to do private sessions with them on Skype and stuff like that. And so, uh, and so, you know, we, we have this whole little, little subculture and, you know, one of the things I like about it is I do not expect or require people to embrace Christian faith or anything like that in order to participate in these things. You know, at the last one, we had a Buddhist guy who came and he loved it. And like, we, we don't violate people's boundaries. And I, I feel like in a lot of ways, Christianity has been reduced to this fire insurance policy where people are running around trying to get you to say the sinner's prayer thing. And it just feels ridiculously manipulative. Um, and what I feel like is, is um, it's not even so much about that. It's about having an inner attitude where you are open to hearing from the head office in whatever manner that the head office is able to speak with you. Um, and then, and then your job as a human being is to go transmit that to other people in the world and to love other people and, 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 and to be excellent and to be really good at what you do. You know, like, like there's a, there's a story about the queen of Sheba going to visit Solomon and it says um, something like, and when she saw the way that his servants were all organized and the, and the tables and the chairs and the place settings and the, and it was almost like the fine details of how he ran the whole place, like right down to like the silverware. She was like, oh my goodness, this guy is divinely blessed. Okay, and, and like, I think there's a lot of people that are, they're, they're trying to go out and like sell Christian fire insurance and, you know, their, their work is mediocre, their books are mediocre, their music is mediocre, their business is mediocre, their marketing is mediocre, their product is mediocre, and nobody respects them. You know, it's like, you know, you can, got, you can honor God by just being incredibly good at what you do. And, and, and by looking at all of your exploration and adventures in the world as this act of worship. You know, it's like even the word worship is all bastardized. Like people think worship is singing Jesus. I love Jesus. Jesus is my boyfriend songs and, you know, in a building with a pipe organ or something like, <laughs> no, like, <laughs> you know, it could be, it could be standing on a cliff in front of the ocean and feeling insignificant. Guys, are you, Perry, you can't see this. There's almost 300 people live right now. The comments are insane, um, insanely good. This is what, this is why I believe we are in the kingdom era, guys. I honestly believe this, Perry, that if we actually modeled the kingdom for people, we would not need altar calls. No, I mean, salvation would be people, nobody, nobody goes to the movie just to buy the ticket. The ticket, <laughs> buy the I just had this hit me. Wow, I'm wow, after the Lord so strong right now. Wow. Nobody goes to the box office to buy a ticket. They want to watch the movie. The kingdom is the movie. The kingdom is, guys, the ticket, the, the, the prayer that we pray, Jesus is the ticket. He's the way in. Without that, we cannot get in. But guys, let's get it. Let, and I'm a, I, we, we cannot exalt Jesus higher. But out of his own mouth, the good news, the gospel is the gospel of the kingdom. And what's not the gospel of salvation? And the reason, Perry, that is we overfocused on this sinner's prayer because we want to feel good about ourselves. We want to have a notch on our belt. I got someone <laughs> saved today. We make it all about us and not about the kingdom. And why I love this conversation so much, Perry, is you are modeling kingdom life, taking bigger risks as a, as a for-profit entrepreneur than, guys, let's just have real talk. I love pastors. I'm not 
I'm not dissing pastors. I love the local church. I'm not dissing local church. But I see a man who is boldly pursuing the presence of God, the spirit of God, taking, taking risk, financial risk, to bring to people an encounter with God. Because we can argue about details in 6,000 years and 20,000 years and 2 billion years. Guys, who cares? I don't know. I don't know how old the earth is. Who, why are we talking about this? I'm not a geologist. But let's talk about <laughs> things I do know. <laughs> let's talk about things I do know. And when, and when Jesus comes to you, which he loves to do in these conversations, that person d- doesn't need any more facts. You cannot talk them out of the, you cannot, they cannot be talked out of what they've experienced. And so apparently like I am going, like, dude, I can just sit here and let you just, I just want to, I just don't want you to stop talking. And either do people on the live, like, this is so great. And this is what guys, this is the opportunity. Let me encourage you. This is not just for Perry Marshall. This is not just for Pedro and Dale. This is for you. Please do not make the mistake we make in church culture of going to conference to conference applauding Christian celebrities. Wow, look at these Christian celebrities. They're so amazing. I wish I could be like them. You are, you can be like them. The same God in them is the same God in you. There's no spectators in the kingdom, guys. There's no spectators in the kingdom. No one tapped Perry on the shoulder. No pastor, no apostle came to Perry and said, hey, Perry, you should start this. You should, some, some unknown prophet, some unknown prophet Vivian from the west side of Chicago from the wrong side of town <laughs> guys this is the kingdom it's fun it's amazing it's free this is not religion religion is gross nobody wants religion nobody wants religion but people are starving for real authentic love and to be encountered by this God that loves them and is majestic and full of wonder and this is what you're seeing is another example, guys, of how to do it in a way that is super attractive. And Perry, you've also happened to build a pretty nice lifestyle for yourself along the way. I don't think you're, you know, you're not on food stamps. You're not praying for financial miracles. We got ministers, missionaries, people that are trying to advance the gospel and their life is a mess because they only have been taught one way to, to beg for donations, to, to, to live by faith, and, and that's great. If you're called to that, praise God. I'm happy it wasn't me. I'm glad it was you. <laughs> and because so, I, and so, Perry, talk about this. You, I mean, talk about what is the opportunity for people today to step in to this type of uh, um, opportunity? I call it the kingdom era. I call it kingdom entrepreneurship. Um, you are a model. You are a kingdom entrepreneur. You are doing this stuff and have been for a long time. Talk to me about what you're seeing. Let me prophesy a bit to us. Speak, you know, you're someone that was there early in everything. You were early to recognize the patterns. What do you see for us? What is the opportunity that we have today as, as kingdom minded entrepreneurs? So I'm going to pick up on your movie ticket analogy. So, People, people ask, okay, so, you know, why, why is life so cruel and why is there so much suffering and, and, and like, what's going on here? And I think that the, the standard Christian answers to that are anemic and, and, and way smaller than, than reality. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. Life is an epic story. Okay. And so think Lord of the Rings, think Star Wars, think Le Miserable, think like, you know, any, like any one of these epic story or, you know, the Odyssey or Beowulf or, you know, or King Arthur. Okay. The, the reason these stories are the way they are is because they represent what life really is like. Hmm. Okay. Now the story most Christians, at least in the United States seem to be in is sort of goes like this. The world was perfect and everything was absolutely great. 
and then at Eve ate an apple, and now everything is spiring down, down, down. Okay, and then when everything gets bad enough, and when there's like enough bombings in Syria and like enough nuclear warheads and all this other stuff, Jesus is going to come and rescue us from everything. So meanwhile, let's just hold hands in the bomb shelter and sing Jesus songs. And this, like, this is the story that most people seem to be living in. Okay. And this so just sucks. And nobody wants the like. This is not attractive to the world. Like, no. Okay. So you know what? The world was never perfect, and the Bible never says it was. Mm. Wow. Okay? The Bible never says the world was perfect. In fact, let me remind you, the Garden of Eden had a snake. And who is the snake? It's ordinarily understood to be Lucifer. And Lucifer is way worse than any bacteria or any AIDS virus or any, okay? Conflict is baked into the equation from the word go. go. Okay? Mm. There was no perfect, okay? Which, I don't know, go read my Evolution 2.0 book if you want to go further down that rabbit hole. But they're just staying in the Bible. It wasn't perfect. It was very good. And, and the trap was poised to spring. It's so the Bible is so the Bible is like Lord of the Rings. It's like Star Wars. It's like the Odyssey. It's all these stories. They all have like the same kind of Art. rhythmic flow. Okay. Yeah, there was this good stuff in the beginning. But then there was a big disaster, and now, you know, hey, Frodo, hey, Luke, right? Luke, I am your father, right? You got that stuff too, right? And it's like this whole, like, excruciating, crazy, uncertain, up and down, tarantula is going to, trying to, Giant tarantula is trying to kill Frodo. You know, this is how life is, okay? And being that it's a movie, like there's all these positions that are available in the movie. You could be an extra. You want to be an extra? You can be an extra. We'll pay you like $50 a day. And like you can stand on the edge of the village and cry during the funeral and... You know, like you can have that part in life. And if you want to just like watch TV or listen to your headphones, then great. You can do that, right? Or, you know, you can be Sam who helps Frodo, or you could be Frodo, right? Now, the way I see the world is like, I'm Frodo, and I can talk to Gandalf when I want Gandalf. And that's what wisdom is, and that's what the Holy Spirit is, and it's like, well, you know, like, are you going to listen to Gandalf or you think you're smarter than everybody else? And that's kind of the question. And so, you know, I, I don't know if this is really true or not, but I kind of live my life with the assumption that if I take on challenges and if I'm constantly putting myself on the firing line, then God doesn't have to smack me on the side of the head to get my attention because he's already got it because I'm already out of my comfort zone. Mm. And, um, you know, I, I remember John Eldridge, he, he wrote this fantastic book called wild at heart and everybody should read that book. He made this great statement. I, he, he might've been more nice about it when he said it, but what he really meant was, most Christian men are pissed off because they're bored and they're sitting in a pew and everybody told them to like be nice and mow their lawn and pay their taxes and obey and sing Jesus is my boyfriend songs on Sunday and they have no adventure and, and like 
the, like they're actually built to go kill orcs and go carry a ring to Mordor and they're watching Netflix on a Tuesday night, drinking a beer and a bag of ruffles and uh, they're bored with their wife and they're bored with their kids and they're bored with their job and they don't have any adventure. Like um, I get this friend named Tom and, and he's dating this woman, Vicky and Tom was not a Christian and Vicky was a Christian and Vicky says to him, so Tom, do you believe in hell? And he goes, Yes, and it starts early. <laughs> oh my goodness. See, you ain't going to get out of life alive. You know, so you might as well take some risks and get something done. Yeah. And I, I don't think it's, it's kind of funny talking about that. And there's, guys, there's whole, a whole, a whole industry there's a whole industry, an industry around male masculinity that is emerged simply to solve the problem that Perry has been talking about. Um, literally, and this, and, and, and of course, some of the market leaders in this industry aren't believers, you know, because again, we were too stuck in our religious frameworks to actually think about creating structures to actually support men um, outside of the four walls of the church. So, of course, we got beat to that as well. And there are, there are men who are running huge movements, training men that are great. And I've taken part in some of, the, of these things as well. And there's some really good stuff. And, of course, there's some really not good stuff. There's, there's some good stuff that is redemptive in nature, that's tied to kingdom, truths, and wisdom. And there's plenty of stuff that is completely demonic, like bad, okay? So here, here's the point, guys. And, and ladies, <laughs> we had Jennifer Allwood yesterday come on. And, I mean, the guys are frustrated. So are the ladies, Perry. They've been told to <laughs> shut up, to cook, clean, honor this man. And quite frankly, they're like, well, what am I honoring? Apathy? Yeah. What am I honoring? Like, like this guy's barely, he's barely alive. He's, he's bored. How can he inspire me? Yeah, they're right. pissed off, you know. So, guys, here we are, so frustrated and constipated. And Jesus is like, wait a minute. I already came. I already came. You have it all. I died that you might have everything. Like, I am, we, we talk about Solomon. We're reading the book of Proverbs, and we're probably not going to get to this today. And who cares? Like, guys, read, like, read your Bible. My God, look at this. This is an amazing conversation here. But here's what's, <laughs> but here's what's happening here. Is like we're reading a book of Proverbs from Solomon, who was the wealthiest man who ever lived, who had that and 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 yet Jesus out of his own mouth said, and and you honor Solomon, the wisdom of Solomon, and yet one greater is now with you, speaking of himself. So we look at Moses, we look at Solomon, we look at David, we look at these, and we keep talking about and honor these, these, these incredible men in history who did all of these things without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. In an in a inferior covenant, in a visitational context where God would visit them. Fast forward to us, we got to be born after Jesus has come has died, has been resurrected, and now we have been all given the access to the Holy Spirit. So we don't have to have a visitational relationship like the men we esteem and honor and learn from. We actually get to have a habitational relationship, and this is what the world is starving for. The world is starving to know, is God real? And if he is real, how come I'm broke? How come I'm sick? And, and they, have, they have hard questions and, and guess what? We have an opportunity, guys, to, to bring some context and shed some light and enter, into a, and enter into a dialogue. But that's only possible in the context of love, in the context of relationship and honor, and not trying to be right by making points. And so, and so guys, I just, Perry, I love what you're talking about, man, because, like, guys, there is... I believe there's so, the world has so many problems 
And we can talk about the problems and be like, man, it's getting darker and darker and get discouraged. Or, yeah. or we can say, look at all these problems waiting for a redemptive kingdom solution to be brought to the table by a kingdom-minded, fully empowered son and daughter of God that know how to bring the kingdom, know how to bring solutions, and can represent him well. And this is my heart, Perry. This is my heart for our whole movement of Hunter X is um, no problem, no opportunity, no conflict, no victory, no war, no warrior. And this is who we are. This is our nature. We are sons and daughters in a kingdom. We have a, we have a, we have a king, not just a king. It's the king of kings. And he wants to do great exploits in and through us. And I just feel, Perry, like that this entrepreneurial landscape and, and I'm bringing on people who are taking territory in government next week. We've got people who are, you know, I have one of my friends who is a PhD at Stanford, right? Talking about education. So it's not, obviously guys, there's realms of culture. Every realm of culture needs a powerful redemptive solution carrier who can represent our king well. Of course, the one I choose to play in is the one that is entrepreneurship, marketing, and, and, that, and that's a big territory. So Perry, talk about, man, first of all, I love 8020. I, I've, got, um, I've listened to 8020 at least three times on mm. Audible, mm. at least three times. Every time I listen to it, I, I, I'm reminded like, why am I not listening to this more? <laughs> why am I not applying this more? Because I always feel like, damn, I'm working too hard. I, I got to, you know, and I, and I probably am. And so just share a little bit of wisdom. Uh, we have a lot of I would say people that are either early stage entrepreneurs here, Perry, or they're maybe W2 employees that, that have a side hustle or want to become a full-time entrepreneur. And really they want to prosper. Like they want to prosper. And mm -hmm. so um, I know a lot of times you, you spend time with people who are already kind of, you know, up to something. They're already, they're already somewhat successful and you kind of just make a few tweaks and boom, they go next level. But I'd love to hear some wisdom for, you know, for what wisdom would you have for people who are in early stage, maybe struggling, maybe not sure about their niche, what offer to make. I just don't know what to do. If I only knew what God would want me to do, I would do it. But you know, like what would you say to that early stage kind of entrepreneur and um, what's the best wisdom you have uh, for them? Well, solve, the hardest problem that you can possibly solve. I mean, there's, you know, people, people look around and they go, well, gee, you know, there's so much competition and, you know, yeah, I could do this or that or this or that. But, you know, there's all, well, the reason the people are doing all of those other things is because they're doable. <laughs> okay. And, you know, if, if you want, if you want to be in a blue ocean, as they say, if you want to like be in a category of one, then find a problem that nobody else wants to solve and solve that. And you could do it in your job. Like, okay, how about this week? If you have a job, ask yourself the question, like several times a day, go, what problem do we have around here that nobody wants to solve? Um, my favorite story to illustrate this is the Beowulf story. Now, probably some of you read Beowulf in high school. I don't think they ever really teach it to you properly. So here, here's the Perry version of Beowulf, okay? <laughs> so there's a king named Hrothgar. And he's got this kingdom, he's got a beer hall, and he likes to, you know, party with his men and in in his army in the beer hall. But there's a problem, which is like every six weeks, this monster named Grendel likes to kick down the door, come in and like kill everybody. And as you can imagine, like that really, <laughs> that's bad, that's bad for the beer hall, you know? Um, it, you get a lot of one-star Google reviews when a monster comes in your beer hall and starts killing people. We're going to have a great night. 
Are we going to be eaten alive? I don't know. Let's go try it out. How bad do you want a beer, right? <laughs> so Prothgar sends out a request for quotes. Okay? <laughs> Who can kill my monster? And Beowulf is a consultant. And Beowulf comes and he's like, well, you know, I swam in the sea for seven days and I killed the sea monster and I can kill your monster. Uh, just like any, consul any consultant story that, the, that you tell at dinner. And, and, and so he's like, okay, you're hired. And so, um, so Beowulf sleeps in the beer hall. And sure enough, <laughs> here comes the monster. Turns out Beowulf's uh, sword doesn't work on Grendel because Grendel has this magic, but uh, Beowulf rips Grendel's arm off. And so Grendel, like, out of its socket. And Grendel goes, like, bleeding, stomping into the swamp and disappears. And, like, well, I guess that's the end of that. And that was the end of that. And, you know, yay! Until Grendel's mother showed up. Uh-oh. And Grendel's mother is not happy. And nobody knew about Grendel's mother. Oh, no. And she is pissed off so she like kills everybody and then goes back into the swamp well beowulf now what are you gonna do so beowulf goes to the swamp now this is where it gets interesting so it says the swamp was so awful that not even a deer being chased by wolves would jump into it. It would rather just be eaten. <laughs> hey, guys, how many of you like me? I have never heard this story, but I went to Catholic school, so this was probably not on the list. I am loving this. I don't even know what the original version of this story was, but who cares? Like, this one, I'm liking it. It is the oldest thing in anything resembling English. It's 13 year, th 1,300 years old. In my... I, I've got an English literature book from college. It's the first story in the book, okay? I'm so, going, just so you know, I'm going to only get the Perry version of this. So, you're, you're, you're getting to, to give me version one of this story. <laughs> so, um, so, Beowulf, like, dives down to the swamp. And it takes him, like, a whole day to get to the bottom. And he takes his, like, magical sword and everything. And he finds Grendel's mother. And they start wrestling. And he finds out oh no, my weapons don't work down here because wow. she has these magic spells and stuff and she's just about to kill him and just then he notices over there there's a sword forged by ogres and he manages to grab it and that sword can cut her head off and, and, she, and he kills her and then he gra drags Grendel's old body back because she was keeping it, you know. Cause she, you know, and, and so now, so he drags Grendel back to the surface and they hang him up in the beer hall. And now, now Beowulf like gets the, the money and the King's daughter and yay. Okay. Now, so this is like the signature story of all problem solving. Okay. And here's what the story says. What the story says is, if you kill a problem and you don't kill the thing that gave birth to the problem, wow. you didn't kill your problem. Jeez. Okay? Now, the only way that you can kill the thing that gave the birth to the problem is go to the swamp that nobody wants to jump into. Wow. Okay. Like, well, nobody wants to do that. Yeah, I know. That's why there's no competition. Hello. Like, well, I want to be a web designer. Yeah. Well, get in line. There's only like 150,000 other people that want to be a web designer. And some okay, of them, so, and some of them will do it for 20 cents a day. <laughs> I know. Right. Good luck with like, that. Well, We'll build you a website for twenty nine ninety five and host it for five years, right? Okay, so so you have to go into the swamp that nobody 
wants to dive into, then when you get to the bottom of the swamp, because the only place where you can solve the problem is at the bottom of the swamp. Okay? That's where Grendel's mother lives. And guess what? Your weapons don't work there. The only weapons that work are the ones that were made at the bottom of the swamp, and you only find them when you get there. So it's a faith journey. And you still might die. I'm not saying you won't. Okay? But he finds the sword with a different kind of magic that, notice it's from long ago. Okay? It's not even new. Right? And then he solves the problem. And then I'll just, I'll just end with this little note. The final, like, at that segment of the Beowulf story, at the end of the segment, the king gives him a speech. And basically, this, like, the king is dying and he's passing, you know, like, the bequeathing everything to Beowulf. Basically, his speech is, and Beowulf, now that you're, you know, you, you, you were 30 times stronger than a normal man when you were born and you killed Beowulf or killed Grendel's mother and everything, don't be an asshole. <laughs> Right, I mean, it is like the greatest story. Um, I'm, and it, nice guy. Here you go. <laughs> it, like, like these these stories really tell you the truth about life. And, and in fact, in the last few years, it's really I've started to realize that for most people, watching a story like Lord of the Rings is just entertainment. But for people who are in the game, mm. it's life education. Wow. Because honest art tells you the truth about life. Mm. Okay. I, I think Lord of the Rings is honest art. Wow. I think Beowulf is honest art. I think in, in, in um, like good science fiction is honest art. So, like, for example, there's, there's some kind of a, I guess it's a science fiction book that had airplanes flying into the Twin Towers. It was written in 1996. Like, most things that are going to happen in the next 20 years or the next 200 years, some author has already written it down. You just don't know which one of those novels... Mm the world is going to turn out like. And so, so yeah. Um, and, you know, and I, I can't overstate the, the, the power of ancient wisdom because you don't know what's going to be different about the world in 50 years, but you know it's easy to predict. It's easy to predict what's going to be the same. Wow. Okay. People are still going to be sit, sitting on tables and chairs and going to restaurants in 50 years. People are going to still drink wine and beer and whiskey and tea and coffee in 50 years. Okay? And human beings are still going to be human beings, and they're going to do all the same stupid stuff. So you can read Cain and Abel and Samson and David and Goliath and all that stuff. And all those stories will be just as true 50 years from now as they are now. And if you know it's going to stay the same, then you're smarter than 90% of the other people in the world who think it's all going to change or think that we all outgrew all this stuff. <laughs> Man. I, that was so rich. Like, these are things, so Perry, one of the things that I'm constantly talking about is you gave me some cool new language for it, you know. Um, you know, I say, I say similar things differently, but I love this. I love the, the swamp analogy. Like, the fact is, guys, that like all the spoils, all the spoils come and 
and and not because you're out for spoils you don't have to be you don't have to some people are more financially motivated and if you are financially motivated I, before you before you try to reject that before you try to shut that down and call yourself carnal like that may be that may be from the lord i don't know i'm not saying maybe you are greedy but just because you are more financially motivated doesn't mean you're a bad person doesn't mean you're greedy that could just be the wiring that god gave you god but, made wolverines too not just poodles. That's it, man. And so here's the thing is that money we know follows value. Like money follows value. There's always, if you, you know, like there's a reason why Saul was like, hey, if you kill this guy, you don't pay taxes, you get my daughter. Like here, like here's, here you go, man. Like if you can do this, it's worth all this. And so guys, nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. There is still massive amounts of value and favor that us gets unlocked when you solve problems. Now, I need a haircut in a week or so. I'm gonna go see my girl at Sports Clips. She solves my problem. That The market says that's a $35 problem. And because she's nice and because I have disposable income, I tip her more and so I'm probably a good customer for her. But like, that's a $35 problem. And, but there are bigger problems out there. That's a, you know, what's the biggest problem that you can solve right now or in the near future, right? If you have to make money right now, you, 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 you need to think about, well, right now, what's the biggest problem that I can solve? Start solving that, start making some money, and then you can be thinking about, okay, what is this to set up to? Because there are businesses in your business. There, God always, he always shows the next thing and the next thing and the next thing and the next thing after you do good with this thing, right? And so... Um, I love this. I love, I love what you said, man, about you have to go deal with the thing that birthed the problem. And this is what, this is a big opportunity for us guys. The world wants to treat symptoms. Yes. Worldly yes. wisdom, the wisdom of man, the wisdom of this world is content solving symptomatic problems, putting band-aids on things because guess what? You can make a ton of money selling Band-Aids. You can get rich just, you can get rich just doing that. And so that's why we have to be more than just financially motivated or else we'll probably keep short of the actual real breakthrough. There's plenty of money in the medication business. There's plenty of money in the cancer treatment space. There's plenty of money in these businesses and, and trading symptoms but what perry's talking about what i'm talking about and what this story is talking about is who is willing to jump in the swamp and go take out the mom and i'm going to tell you few and if you're one of them man oh man now know what you count the cost know what you're signing up for right but i believe that god is just looking to partner with people like that will say, will you trust me to meet you at the bottom? To me, I thought about Jesus, Perry. I'm like, I think about Jesus. How much faith did Jesus have to have to go? It says he went into Sheol. It says he went into hell. Like, I don't know what that was like. I don't think that was like an amazing, hey, awesome. I get to go to hell for three days today. And like, wow. I mean, but, but he, he's, we have the empowerment of Jesus. Like, can we, will we trust him? And this is where, guys, I kind of I kind of poke at you planners a little bit here. I poke at you detailed people a little bit here that want all the details, want the pull, the whole plan, want all the steps. Guys, that's really great when you can get it. I just don't see a lot of that. The people that, <laughs> the people that we honor, the people we tell stories about, the people that have legendary lives that make impact forever don't seem to have that same need to have every single step figured out, there is a measure of faith and trust that says, I know I'm called to this. I'm going to go do this, and, and God will meet me there. This is what David said. He said, you know, he said, the God of Israel will defeat you today. You will be taken down, right? And my God, and da -da -da, right? And so I just feel like God is like saying, where are my sons and daughters that will trust me a little bit? that I got their back. I'll be with them and I will provide them the sword 
when they need it. And all of me, we want the swords in the living room. I don't need a sword right now. I'm in my kitchen. I don't need a sword, but we want the sword now and then go to war. And that's, I know that's not life in the kingdom. No, it's just not life no. in the kingdom. And I just, it, it's just not life in the kingdom. And, and, and I just, can we just be honest about this? Perry, yeah, I, see, I, I, see I am, I, I am still out of my comfort zone. I mean, I, I, I was telling somebody, couple weeks ago like yeah i i know i know you're you're supposed to have like you know six months of cash saved up and just you know ready for a disaster and you're supposed to be doing this and you're supposed to be doing that like well i'm sure i could do all of that except i wouldn't be able to press the edge of the things like like really the last I don't know how many years. I mean, I've just been stretching as hard as I can to get the things done that are really important. And I am constantly out of my comfort zone and I constantly don't know like how we're going to make this work. Um, and, you know, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm just like living on a prayer in some irresponsible way, but I'm saying like, like, you know, that, that parable of the talents, the guy that gets criticized is the guy that buried it so he wouldn't have to take a risk. It's like, well, at every level of life, and it doesn't, it doesn't matter whether you make $10,000 a year, $100,000 a year, a million dollars a year, $10 million a year, at every, every one of those levels, there's levels of taking risks. Mm. Okay, and... And there's things that will never happen unless you do take the risks. And so, um, and there's wisdom, right? Perry, God, yeah. God is providing us wisdom. We're not so just so we're all clear. We're not talking about stupid, like reckless living. We're not no, talking about no, jumping no, off no, of no, a bridge no. with no parachute. What we're talking about is there is this, there is an invitation from the Lord to trust Him in a way that is where we know we're going to need him. And I'm being challenged here, even at another level, as I enter 2020, and I think about the things that I've, I feel the Lord is asking us to do this year, and I'm like, hmm, do I really think I can do those just in my own ability? Perry, help, talk to, talk to, for a second, just talk to me right now. Let's pretend that we don't have 314 people watching. Just talk to me right now, and let's see if this helps anybody else. What about when you are pretty skilled at some stuff? What about when you do have some juice? What about when you can do some things in your own ability because you've worked hard, you have skills, and you kind of know what buttons to push? Talk to me for a second. How, well, how, how and, and how, how, talk to people on this call who are already doing some pretty cool things in life and, and they've, they've worked hard to get to a place in life where they pretty much can create results in a very somewhat safe and predictable manner. What does it look like to, to dream bigger, think bigger? And how are you? Cause Jay, you're a very capable man that you are a skillful man. Like, you know how to play the game and push the buttons and do the thing Perry. And so I'm, I'm, I want to know how are, how do you lean in? and continue to be at this, at this razor, razor's edge because I want to learn about that. I want to be there. I don't want to just rest and settle in a place of, of, of just kind of building on what's possible and what's simple and what seems to be very much in my strength. Um, I'd love to hear about your journey and how you stay at that place. So I've got this phrase – one long shot and three fish in a barrel. And you can apply it to two different situations. So the first situation is if you're starting out and you don't have very many resources, then your, your risk appetite should be like, I'm going to do three things that I can count on are going to work. And I'm going to do one thing that's like rolling the dice. Okay. 
And that's a pretty good way to make sure that you don't end up with uh, your clothes thrown in your front yard by your wife who just left you. (laughs) All right. So just to recap, three things that I feel confident I can pull off, three fish in the barrel. Yeah. In one long shot. And a long shot, which is, hey, this could work, might not work, but big payoff. So there's risk. There's some risk, but the reward is significant and justifiably so. And I believe wisdom, Perry, wisdom is not per se the elimination of risk. Hmm. I just think wisdom yeah. means, means pushing risk into a corner. How do I make risk as small as possible? Because to me, taking risk, taking any measure of risk, that doesn't come with a much more leveraged payoff Mm. is foolishness. Right. And this is the world system. This is Wall Street. Give me your money. Let me gamble your money. We win even if you lose. And there are people right now, I believe, Perry, risking half of their life savings to maybe make a 5 to 8% return this year. To me, that is dumb. That's not wisdom. But what if you could take it, but flip it around. What if there was a 10% chance of loss for a 300% return? Yes. I like that. I'll play that game all day long. So yeah. I believe wisdom is, is making calculated decisions based on risk, quantifiable risk, when possible. We don't always, we're not always given this from the Lord. <laughs> but when you can ascertain, how do you take, how do you put risk reward greatly in your favor. I think that's what we're talking about. Just to give some context, Perry, do you want to add some color to that? Well, okay. So now let's talk to the successful person. And so now instead of, you know, your fish in a barrel, instead of being your, a job at Trader Joe's, um, your fish in a barrel is, you know, making a thousand bucks an hour doing like whatever you're good at doing. Okay. Well, One thing I've noticed, you know, my sister made a comment to me. She's a commercial real estate agent. She goes, I know a lot of guys in their mid fifties, they're soft, they're flaccid, they're not adventurous. They're not willing to try anything new. They're just trying to be comfortable. That's like, like zero long shots and three fish in a barrel. Okay. Like, I think if you're not making long shots, you're, you're on the road to the grave, okay? Now, there are some people who can afford to do one fish in a barrel and three long shots because they have so much money. Um, or, or um, you know, keep your three long shots, but like all of those, all of those sure things, they go they, that money gets invested into the thing that has like the long shot that might have the super high upside. Mm-hmm. And um, in, in like, I, I just, I, I just think if you're not, if you're not scaring yourself a little bit on a consistent basis, you're, you're going soft and, mm-hmm. um, and that's, that's boring. Right. Like, so, so that's, uh, you know, um, I, I'm not, I'm not telling you to like risk at all, but you should risk what you care about. You know, maybe, maybe you're pretty wealthy and maybe you put enough aside that, you know, that you never end up on the street, but that doesn't mean that you're not taking risks with money that you care about. Like, man, I earned this and this is valuable and I could lose this. And then, um, and, and then you're, you're, you're better at all of your decisions because you're, you're, you're playing a skin in the game game. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. All right, Perry, I, we need to at least talk about one verse to make this a legal Bible study. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to pick one that I think is, is very much appropriate for this conversation and then we can begin to land the plane. I, I, we, I could do this all day with you, man. Like this is, bro. Yeah, we'll have to wrap up. <laughs> I don't, I don't even, yeah. um, we, I, we got to figure something out, man. I, I, we, I got to come see you. I got to come to Chicago or something. I hate the cold, but you're worth it, man. But let's talk about a verse 
that is exactly on point for what we're looking at. And it's Proverbs 14.4. 14, 14.4. 4. The only clean stable, talking to you guys right now, the only clean stable is an empty stable. So if you want the work of an ox and you want to enjoy an abundant harvest, you'll have a mess or two to clean up and everybody wants the work of an ox and nobody wants the mess. Absolutely. Ox is poop. Ox business, is poop. business is messy. Success is messy. Um, entrepreneurship is messy. And what you do is you go make the messes and you clean them up later. And you can hire other people to clean them up. You know, you can have support staff, you, you know, whatever. Have your kids help you. But yeah, success is messy. And, um, you know, sometimes, sometimes there's going to be white knuckle moments. And, um, you know, and you, you just keep, you know, look, Pedro, what you just said a, a little while ago is like, th there are a lot of people risking their whole life savings to make five to 8% in the market. And then there's other investments where, you know, you risk 10% of your life savings and on the one in a hundred chance that it pays off, like it could make you millions and millions and millions of dollars. And those are the kind of investments that you look for. And those are the kind of investors that you pay attention to. And, and so, um, yeah, like you're, you're never going to have it all figured out. And, and I think one thing I, I guess one of the reasons that I love my little demilitarized zone of, you know, people of all different points of view is that, is that whether whether people think of themselves as entrepreneurs or not, entre all entrepreneurs live by faith. Mm. Okay. And, and God honors that. You, 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 know, you know what these exact, the opposite, the polar opposite is the bureaucrat where everybody else takes the risks and they don't take any risk at all. Mm. And I am... I am, I don't know how to put it. I am diametrically opposed and cannot stand people like that. And I can smell them a mile away. And, and, the, and the comment that I'll make about those, those people don't get wisdom because frankly, they don't need it. Wow. Um, and, 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 uh, and, uh, bureaucrats hate skin in the game people. They smell us a mile away. And they don't, they don't like it when their ignorance gets exposed. Um, so uh, don't, don't be surprised if your tolerance for bureaucracy goes down and down and down as you, the higher you climb as an entrepreneur. Uh, and, and just one final thought to that is, as kingdom people, I don't care how you get paid. I don't care if you're a double two employee. I don't care if you work for someone else. We all have a, we all have access and we all should be tapping into an entrepreneurial spirit, an entrepreneurial grace, which is a grace and a spirit to solve problems. And to ask Perry, the question that just is the, one of the best questions I've ever heard asked is what is the problem that nobody is solving? What is the problem that nobody wants to solve? right now, right here. That one question can take you out of your story of, I'm so confused, what do I do? If I only knew, stop hiding behind that and change your language and ask a better question because God wants to use you right now, not in 20 years, right now. Be why? Because he loves his people. The Queen of Sheba had the wisdom to say, Solomon, God has blessed you for his love for his people. It's for his people's sake he's blessed you. So maybe we get out of ourselves, get out of our own way, stop making it all about us, and say, God, who do you want to, who, who do you love so much that you're, that you're willing and happy to bless me in the process by loving and serving them? 
That's an amazing question. So I don't care if you're a W two employee. I'm, we're not. You don't have to quit your job to go be in, to to be a uh, quote unquote real entrepreneur. Have a have an entrepreneurial spirit. Have an entrepreneurial grace. Have a grace of the kingdom to solve problems where you are today, and that will have you grow in wisdom and favor, and and prosperity, and your whole life can begin to accelerate. Because when you solve problems, you unlock favor. Perry, this has been incredible, my man. Um, can I ask you to can I ask you to want any final thoughts you want to share? And then can I ask you to pray for us and pray us out today? Um, yeah, I, I would like to invite you guys, if you go to perrymarshall.com, scroll down, you'll find a 30-day street MBA. There's an email series. Yep. Um, subscribe to that. I promise you, it'll punch you in the face in the very first email. I promise. Um, so, yeah, well, God, thank you for being here. Thank you for being present. Um, thank you for the just the manifest presence of, of God with me, with Pedro, for all, all these people. And, you know, whatever you've um, planted in the hearts of these people to do, just uh, may they go do them. May, may they go do those things. Amen. Amen. I love it. I love it. Guys, go check out Perry Street MBA. I, I've, I've, that's an, that's an awesome email sequence. And um, Perry, man, thank you so much. I just want to just like so honor you as a forerunner in in this as a kingdom entrepreneur. Um, man, this this conversation really, really has blessed me, um, challenged me, blessed me, encouraged me. And I know if it's doing that for me, it's doing that for me. We got over three hundred people here. The hearts are going crazy. Um, Thank you so much for your time. And uh, man, I can't wait to our next conversation. All right, guys, the homework, go live. Which one of the 85,000 amazing things that Perry said, you know, is, is really impacting you the most? And special bonus session tonight, tonight, 5.30, special bonus session. Wisdom for how to prosper as a kingdom entrepreneur. I'm going to take you guys on a deeper dive into, into things I've learned that's allowed me to go from broke, suicidal, and depressed, and three million dollars in the hole, and how we broke, and how we had our first seven-figure year, broken in seven figures within three years of of basically wanting to just die and give up, and then how some things we've learned here with Hunter X. So if you are hungry and desirous to prosper as a kingdom entrepreneur, don't miss that session tonight, five thirty Pacific. Perry, amazing man, thank you so much. We'll see you next time. All right, guys, see you guys tonight, five thirty. Peace.